Welcome everybody to episode two of The Focus. I'm Aldo Roll. And this is Horia. So Horia, what are we discussing today? Today uh, we're going to look at um, some of the conflicts between governance and modern ways of working. And um, to attempt to address these conflicts, we are going to propose a number of ways of looking at oversight. We're going to remind ourselves why we chose the, the term oversight rather than governance and why adaptive. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I wanted to jump straight into there, and this is just talking about these conflicts between governance and modern ways of working. And just want to put that uh, out as a little bit of background. Um, of what we notice uh, when we help organizations with their renewal. Um, so one of the, the, the key things that uh, we notice uh, that causes part of this conflict is I've seen this phenomenon where an organization has decided that they will adopt new ways of working, call it agile or whatever it is, or a specific framework but they only do that with one portion of the organization. And of course, that is, uh, causes major upheaval for parts of the other, other parts of the organization that does not necessarily uh, are part of that. And that is one of the conflict points that we notice. Um, Horia, have you got any other examples uh, from, from that, uh, this phenomenon of this, this conflict? Well, um, ego plays a, a big part of it as well, often. In other words, um, I uh, am a leader. I have been appointed to such and such a prestigious uh, role. And therefore, I start to believe that uh, I'm the one who should be calling all the shots. Uh, what I say has to go. Uh, I'm the one uh, that has the utmost importance in the organization. And if others propose or draw my attention to obstacles and difficulties and so on, uh, I don't necessarily have to listen or take into account those considerations. I can, through my, the force of my vision and charisma, I can simply impose it on people and therefore somehow my pushing is going to yield benefit and I'm going to then congratulate myself. See, I knew you could do it. Wonderful. Well done. Um, as opposed to genuinely engaging with people and understanding what is and isn't uh, reasonable and achievable. And um, as a result, causing a lot of um, suffering for a lot of people involved. One other form of this conflict is also uh, some people not understanding the unintended consequences of uh, adopting new ways of working in, in a specific context. So we, our friend Al Shalloway keep talking about asking what are the risks? Um, why are you not attending to any of the risks when it comes to uh, your agile adoption journey? Why are you not managing it as on a risk-based approach? And that, that really causes a lot of, uh, uh, causes uh, uncertainty, as well as make people nervous. It's like, oh, this part of the organization is adopting this new way of working, but we still need to have some form of governance over this. What, how do we govern this? Or, yeah, um, did, how, how well does that uh, play out in an organization? <laughs> well, um, one of the things that I find is a clash of expectations, a clash of um, awareness. In other words, um, throughout people's careers, um, I'm thinking over the last 40, 50 years, most of the time people were accustomed to, um, you make a plan, you work the plan, results will follow. Um, 20 years ago, the average project duration was somewhere between 18 and 36 months, something like that. And for a sizable investment like that, you make a 
a sizable plan and then you execute the plan. Uh, you have much more of a, a sequential expectations. Things were expected to be not so changeable, fairly predictable, and therefore you make a plan, you follow the plan. Think, for instance, I want to build a road from this city to that city. Well, I should know where is the road supposed to go through, how many tons of materials for each kilometer of road. Therefore, it should be reasonable to expect that I should be able to have a reasonable plan as to what happens in March, what happens in April, and so on. Yes, there may need to be contingencies based on weather uh, events and other things, but by and large, a predictive approach is okay. And therefore, because most people for most of the time were accustomed to predictive approaches to planning, the oversight community was accustomed to the same thing. Show me the plan. Show me how you're progressing with the plan. Okay, you're in good progress with the plan. Things should be good, right? Right. Now, in the last 20 years, we've been inundated with new opportunity uh, in the world of digital technology. Um, our computing capacity has skyrocketed. Uh, our ability to deploy and test and validate new and globally consumable solutions has literally gone almost off the charts, right? If you might remember uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted a new server to be installed in, in an organization, you needed to actually wait for the physical thing to be delivered to a particular data center, then install, installed in there, wired. It would take a few weeks until a new compute capacity element could be introduced in your organization. Uh, these days, what with cloud computing and so on, you want a new server, you click a button, and a few moments later, you have a new compute unit available to you. So that has dramatically changed how we react, how we interact with technology. So therefore, the usual more sequential conveniently relaxed oversight approach needs to change to be able to cope with this much faster speed of opportunity and adaptation. But this is not just for projects. We also notice it in service delivery as well as products uh, and product ma manufacturing, product management and, and delivery. It's, it, it, it's not just in the space of projects. So uh, what, what, what we're noticing is that, that, that what Horia just spoke about in the project domain has also got vast implications in those other two domains. So I think Horia has already alluded to that, but I have, a, I have an in, in, inline question here around this. Um, I, I was wondering, and we, that's why we started this research is because we were wondering about how well the oversight or the governance has kept up with these rapid changes that Horia, in technology that Horia spoke about. How well has the oversight capability function or governance kept up with this rapid changes? And that is why we started talking about adaptive oversight. So if you can recall from episode one, um, revisiting just a little bit about the reason why we call it adaptive oversight and not necessarily lean governance, is that oversight has got those two meanings. The first one is actually the act of overseeing and whether that sits in a project or a product or a service delivery uh, 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 domain or context, that doesn't matter, it still requires overseeing. The overseeing is still required because you're either spending public money, if you're in government or a social sector, or you are spending the shareholders money. And that is really important for those people. They wanna know how you spend it. So that's one of the reasons why we keep, uh, we, we, we wanna focus on oversight. The second part of oversight or the second definition of oversight is what Horia alluded to last week is about making sure that we, if we have missed something, oops, that was an oversight, is to actually have the correction that goes with that, is to make sure that if you have over, uh, uh, missed something or you had an oversight, <laughs> Um, is to actually recover from that um, 
without uh, major damage or upheaval. Um, so, Horia, talk about a little bit about the adaptive part of it because that's really important as well. Yeah, I think uh, an interesting factor here is to realize that it's not about right and wrong. It's not about one single way being the right way and all other ways being wrong ways. It's not about a singular perspective to say one person says something, one person knows something, and that's the one true way and everybody else is wrong. Uh, as, as far as complex systems and complex delivery is concerned, we always have to negotiate what success actually looks like. What is successful? What is actually achievable? Is this thing that we got good enough? And it's fascinating that over time, things that were considered ah, oof, ah, fine, we're going to live with it. Over time, the more we use them, the more we find, oh, actually, you know what? We can do a lot with this. It can be quite cool. So um, the human history is full of examples of things that originally, when they were first put together, people didn't quite know how to deal with them, didn't know quite how to, to cope with them. But then over time, more and more of us got accustomed, more and more of us uh, embraced the idea, more and more of us actually practice it as a matter of routine thing, for instance, of uh, toothbrushes and brushing teeth, right? It's an unusual thing to get a brush and kind of mash it in your mouth twice a day, right? It's quite a, quite a habit to, to develop. So it took quite a while for that to develop as a broadly practiced human habit. It's the same kind of thing. Adaptation is necessary because we engage in some actions, we get some results, but then maybe we go a little bit too far. Our new way of doing things has been too strict, too constrained, and now we need more adaptability. Therefore, we need to relax certain constraints and uh, decide on a, on a different path. This is, um, for instance, one of the uh, examples in modern organizations is this idea of ambidextrous um, organizational pursuit. Uh, what that means, kind of Ambidextrous means capable with both hands. You might say, on the one hand, you have to deliver your high value product and deliver and deliver and deliver and deliver. But on the other hand, you have to disrupt yourself as well because other people will innovate. They will create new and better and different products. And therefore, eventually your product may become useless. Think for instance, of the example of Kodak. Um, they were, um, an organization that made lots of money in film and photography using chemical processes. The Kodak company actually invented the digital camera many years ago. But because they had such an interest in selling lots and lots of plastic uh, film and the necessary chemicals and papers and so on to print photography and use chemical photography, they neglected the tremendous opportunity of digital photography. And as a result, they lost the boat. They did not manage to adapt sufficiently fast in order to catch the wave of digital photography. And the rest is history. They went bankrupt. So that's why we call it adaptive oversight, just as a, a, a reminder for everybody. Now, we are going in this uh, uh, podcast series, we actually in investigate this phenomenon. And today we're going to share the first bit of that, uh, of, of the research that we've done and our thinking up to date. So as I uh, said in the, in the beginning, this is about introducing adaptive oversight. And for today's episode, we wanna just give you that mile wide, inch deep overall picture of adaptive oversight. And then with following uh, uh, episodes, we will be diving a little bit deeper into each one of those key areas or key concepts that we found. Now, 
the we've done uh, quite a lot of research we interviewed an immense amount of people uh in workshops that uh that that uh, that we came up with uh, uh, when we did the research for adaptive oversight and horia is busy sharing the screen and this is sort of the distillation the, the high level distillation of what we found with the research that we have done. And we'll take you through that uh, in a minute, but this thing that Horia talked about uh, a little bit earlier about having balance, um, it's really important that when we talk about adaptive oversight that we do consider a balanced perspective. And that is why all of these look like little scales uh, that Horia is sharing on the screen. And that's all that will also be available later on the website that, that we have that you can actually go and have a, a look at it. What we want, why we want to focus on balance uh, perspectives, it's that it's 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 not um, it's not us, we, we don't want the us versus them uh, dynamic. It's us new uh, us people implementing this new, very important framework for the organization and them, those people that used to do the governance and the overseeing of things. Um, for, the for the organization and their customers to win, it has to be an and conversation. It has to be about that taking a balanced perspective inside that context from both parties. And when we started off today's session, it was, or the, the, the episode earlier to today, we emphasized that we noticed this conflict and we realized that you cannot um, perpetuate this conflict by talking about those people or them or they. It is an us and together we have an and. We have both those perspectives. And then we come up with that third idea or that third alternative or a greater vision that unites us all. And that's why all of these uh, are, um, you also know, are uh, explained in terms of balances. And Oriana and I will explain a little bit later the research method that we've used but we found it really uh, amazing to actually see how we can balance uh, between those different perspectives. Oria. Mm. So um, to take an example, in a particular organization that wants to be effective, we must have some control. We must have some clarity of who's in charge, what is it that we're supposed to be achieving, and therefore exert some form of control. Because if there's no control, then everybody can do whatever they feel like doing, and there's no guarantee that we're going to get any particularly meaningful result. So there has to be control. But at the very same time that we must have control, we also need to invest in trust. Because if I'm trying to be too micromanaging um, of people, then people will get demotivated. Uh, I'm engaging people to join my organization for their know-how and their intellect. If I don't give them the freedom to innovate and to apply their own energy and motivation, I'm essentially robbing myself of a great number of opportunities. So therefore, at the same time that I want to exert control, I must find a way of developing good trust. So I have to understand What's necessary in terms of balancing how much control versus how much trust? In other words, if I have some people that are not very well prepared, not very well trained, not very well um, capable, their competence level is modest. If I don't control them sufficiently well in the sense of, I will give you training, I will give you opportunities to develop your skill. I will give you opportunities to fall safely. Notice I'm using fall rather than fail, right? Because when you're learning to walk, you're not really failing at walking. You're just falling down a lot, which is okay. 
because that's how over time you then get excited and learn how to walk and then to run very nicely. So this, similarly, we need to have, um, you see here another balance of safety and courage. I need to have the ability, the safety to try things out and the courage to push the boundaries and fall safely from time to time. Yeah. So again, that's another balance. So when I'm controlling, in order to develop the trust, in other words, now I see that you have the capability, now I see that you're well accustomed, now I see that you could deliver, therefore, I can move away from control and more towards trust. And then I have to keep in balance because things will change. People will move to other organizations, people will join my organizations, they don't have the same history, the same demonstrated level of competence and capability. So therefore, there will be a bit of a seesaw between, between control and trust. And that's another reason why adaptive, you have to keep a dynamic balance. It's not a static balance. It's not a one recipe, one method to say, this is it, implement this perfect methodology and you're, you're going to be sorted. No, it has to change based on the current situation of the actual people involved in the situation. Now, Horia, you've been working quite a lot in the project management space uh, over the years. You, you, you've been part of uh, prominent organizations in, in the project management space. And when I did my pro learning about project management, I learned about the Iron Triangle. And um, that was quite a, a, a very tight set of constraints or controls uh, imposed on uh, projects um, where you have to balance uh, uh, time, uh, quality, cost, and, and the actual underlying dollar value. Um, so in terms of managing that old way i've really seen project managers struggle quite a lot to balance all three of those elements of the iron triangle so it was scope uh, i got it slightly wrong so scope budget and time and i've seen project managers turn themselves into pretzels to try and balance the uh the constraints between those three things if you if you give on scope then that means you 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 run into trouble with time, or if you if you um, squeeze the time, you run into trouble with 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 the scope, and of course the the money men uh, always keep their finger on on the pulse when it comes to the cash flow, and then suddenly you find you don't have as much money as you thought, and then you squeezed on scope and time. So it's always a very difficult thing to balance. What the Agile world has actually done is came up with the Agile triangle, where you need to rather uh, looking at those dimensions of scope, time and, and budget is to actually balance value, quality and constraints. And one of the balances that project managers and, and to some degree program managers as well as uh, product managers have to do is that maybe some of their teams work in a new way of working in uh, or potentially an agile way of work, agile ways of working, and they still need to manage and govern in older ways in the old iron triangle. And that causes real friction between uh, the teams that are working in agility or and or the PMO, uh, for instance, because they've got very strict guidelines about uh, a few things and then suddenly the new ways of working does not, does not necessarily serve their needs. And this is another form of conflict that I've noticed firsthand um, and I've experienced it firsthand. So as part of the, uh, the, the key things that we need to balance is to consider how do we operate with the balance between the iron and the agile triangles. Um, Horia, any other thoughts around this specific um, balance? Yeah. Um, some things that are not immediately obvious is, um, one of them is value. Who gets to decide what value is? Value for whom? 
is it value for the team that's doing the work? Is it value for uh, some of the stakeholder groups that are served by the products or services that the, uh, that the team is creating? Um, if the team does some work for some other colleagues within the organization, uh, is, is it value for the teammates within the organization or is it value for what's the actual impact on the customers of the organization? Right? So there are really tricky questions. Um, too often in commercial settings, most people, when you say value to them, they'll, their, their eyes will, will go and make sort of money uh, symbols, like money, money, value, value, money, money. But the thing is, and we were learning the, uh, this in the realm of boards of directors and organizations these days, we have significant uh, environmental, um, societal, and governance concerns. So uh, people talk about ESG, um, and that means, hold on a second, value cannot afford to be just, let's make a buck, let's make a buck, uh, mm. and the world goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, we have to figure out a way of how do we make society be less divided and more harmonious, more enjoyable, more engaging? How do we uh, make value mean not just profits, 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 and contribute to vast Oh, um, divisions and segregations and disparities in um, financial ability and, and resources. Um, and how do we make it so that uh, governance happens in an equitable and ethical manner? How do we make it so that there's more ability? Yeah. Um, just for our viewers, um, ESG um, stands for? Environmental, societal, and governance. I kind of alluded to them yes. uh, independently. That's why I call them ESG. Um, okay. That way. Um, it, it's a common topic uh, that yep. a lot of people in boards of directors and other governance forums are, are well familiar with uh, these years. The Institute of Directors throughout the world uh, will have had numerous um, webinars and events on the topic. Um, now, value, as I've just um, highlighted, is, is a whole broad concern, but so is quality. <laughs> because again, it has some uh, some aspects of value are, are tightly interrelated with, with quality. And uh, as anyone who's worked in software intensive systems development knows, who gets squeezed, usually it's the poor testers. Because if the time must be met and the scope is that, and we only have this much budget, hey, we have some code, let's throw it over the wall and hope that the customers will, will kind of have something workable. And the quality might be suspect at the time, right? So what we're saying with this balance between the IR and the Agile Triangle is, yes, we need to pay attention to value and quality within the given constraints, but at the same time, there will be budget and time and scope um, aspirations. So these things need to be balanced and again in a dynamic fashion. Thank you. Aurea, can you go back to the other picture that we had? Sure. Um, sure. Okay. So uh, as a mile wide inch deep exploration um, for the iron triangle and the agile triangle, that sort of gives you an idea of what we explore in that domain. Mm. We also noticed, and um, uh, earlier in this this, this podcast, we talked about ego, and this is also looking at the aspects of how do you balance personal interest of, um, of governance or the oversight uh, capability uh, as well, uh, or other uh, people, how do you balance the, those personal interests with the organizational purpose? We found that that's usually uh, one of the roots of, of friction um, that uh, that comes out, um, and I don't want to talk derogatory here, but usually highly bureaucratic organizations uh, display this conflict quite prominently um, in, 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 in the research that we found. So we explore the balance between those two as well. And again, you, you cannot totally discount personal interest in what you do, but one of the things uh, to consider is the ego element uh, associated with that. Um, 
the alignment with people's uh, interest with uh, organizational purpose is also an important factor. We need alignment there and we need balanced alignment. We can't just have people ignore all of their families in, in, uh, in, in focusing just on the organization. So that's a really interesting balance when it comes to adaptive oversight. It talks a lot more about the, the human aspects of uh, uh, getting effective uh, oversight happening. Yeah, another way of framing this would be we need to balance um, selfishness or narcissism <laughs> with, uh, with altruism. Well, I right. use the safer word for ego, but okay, that's fine. <laughs> right. Because from a certain perspective, if I'm always sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing and I'm depleting myself, I won't be able to bring the best version of me because I'm always depleted. There's nothing replenishing me. There's nothing renewing me. I'm always sacrificing. So in other words, I can't just put everything for the organization, for the organization, right? Uh, humanity has tried this in the past with um, very poor results right? Um, we're, we're not geared all that well just yet to be genuinely altruistic. Most of the time, we're rather selfish. We care more about ourselves and what's in it for us. And if we're lucky, um, a circle of loved ones. And usually, we don't care all that much about those people over there. And the further away from us they are, the less we care, because hey, out of sight, out of mind. Now, what we're saying, remember the intention of the focus is we're curious about what would it take to get our way of work to be really enjoyable. In other words, sustainably enjoyable. Not just we're having fun today, but we continue to enjoy the work day after day, year after year, decade after decade. How come we could leave a world that's way better than we found it? How would we do that? Well, that requires us to not just be selfish and have the most that we can right now selfishly and be a bit egotistical and narcissistic about it, but it requires a bit of altruism from us. It requires a little bit of sacrifice, a bit of focus on what's in it for the organizational purpose. So that's the idea of there has to be win-win. I'm not saying let the organization win and we lose, no. But the, if the organization succeeds and we equitably get rewarded, we share in the glory that we achieve through the organization. Our individual energy and effort and contribution is well rewarded by the success that the organization enjoys. And that's awesome. That gives us tremendous satisfaction. Remember, we talked in the last episode about Ikigai. That's an, another aspect of this. There's nothing wrong with ego. Because there has to be something in you that says, I want to become better. I want to be better, not just for myself, but for the people around me. But the thing is, and this is where leadership comes into play, if ego is all that matters, if me is all that matters, and I'm a leader, well, if I win and the people that I lead lose, well, I'm not a leader. I'm a con artist. I've managed to deceive everybody because I got all the winnings and they have all the suffering. Well, that's not leadership. Right? The personal interest kind of ignore the organizational purpose, because if everybody else lost and I won, well, how healthy, how thriving is that organization? The answer, not at all. So there has to be enough successful and enjoyable contribution and achievement in all of the organization or the vast majority of it for the personal interest to be well supported and thriving in the long run as well. That's the general idea of personal interest to organizational purpose balance. Cool. Moving on to the next balance, where we look at the competent capability balanced with explore and uh, innovate. Um, this one, if you'll forgive me, Aldo, for interrupting, has a bit of a backstory to it. Yeah. So um, what we had in our research is we had actually three different uh, balances, because we consider these balances deliberately from different perspectives. So for instance, we had the balance of preserve the status quo versus create a better way of working. And this was a balance seen from the perspective of the people in the uh, oversight community primarily. 
In other words, as an oversight practitioner, I must preserve the status quo, but on the same time, I must create a better way of work. This is kind of that strategic ambidextry that uh, we were talking about uh, a few moments earlier. The keep it steady versus invite exploration, that uh, balance was seen or imagined from the perspective of the initiative doing the work. In other words, our um, leaders want us to keep things steady, to keep the lights going, to um, keep the organization humming, deliver good value and service. But at the same time, we're asked to invite exploration, not uh, just keep things going indefinitely as is. We need to become better to engage in some form of continuous improvement or continual depending on school of thought and so on. That's a whole different conversation. And finally, the follow the new rules and change the rules was a balance imagined from the perspective of now we're putting these two together because we are noticing that in the process of balancing and rebalancing things, we're generating new rules, but at the same time, um, we need to keep changing them and we need to follow them and we need to change them and follow and change them and follow them. So again, it's a new dynamic balance. So um, while in our research, we, we took this um, more intricate decomposition, we then struggled with how on earth are we gonna explain this simply uh, for people. And we came to the conclusion that perhaps let's try and collapse all of these three into something a little bit, hopefully simpler, that keeps the essence of competent capability on the one hand. In other words, we're competent, we're capable, we're keeping the lights going really well, and explore and innovate or exploration and innovation as the other um, alternative. And that's why um, we had the uh, competent capability and explore and innovate as the things to balance in the um, in this particular aspect of the structure. So one of the metaphors when we discuss this and trying to figure out how to break it down or how to um, to to uh, get it neater, one of the ideas discussed behind that was about breaking technology on cars. And the reasons why the reason why brakes exists is that cars could go faster. And I really struggled to get my head around that the very first time I heard that. Uh, it's so counterintuitive. And with the with the uh, improvement in braking technology, that actually allows cars to go faster. So that was basically the the tension that we have in what we've uh, in um, in the comp uh, competent capability and the explore and innovate is to use the metaphor of breaking technology on cars to allow the organizations to go faster. So I, I, when, once I got my head around that, it was a really beautiful metaphor for me uh, around mm -hmm. that. Okay. Lastly, and this was by far <laughs> the most contentious uh, topic that we, uh, um, when we did research with with the, the people around the world, this was by far one of the most <laughs> talked about tensions uh, that that we found, and and this was about balancing safety with courage. We want to be safe, but we also need to have the courage to go out there and try new things or uh, improve or 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 uh, uh, anything like that. So there was a, again a lot of human factors at play. Uh, we talk about biases, we talk about motivational theory, we talk about a lot of psychology when it comes to uh, handling change. Um, so safety and courage as a balance was really fascinating uh, uh, for us. No. Um, yeah, Moria, uh, I enjoyed that one by far. It was the most interesting debates that, that, that we observed when it yeah. came to those two. There are a lot of um, powerful things that are involved in this balance. On the one hand, we say we must be equitable. We must be genuine. We must be authentic in how we communicate. And yet, in our current society, um, various vocal proponents are attempting to stifle means of expression. The purpose, the intention of what we're discussing is being hidden behind facades of what words are and aren't 
appropriate, what people are and aren't allowed to say. We're forgetting the necessity for, for free speech. We're forgetting the necessity for psychological safety to actually engage in speech that is truthful. We have more and more people actively censoring their own speech for fear of social marginalization at the hands of a few um, very vocal social media uh, activists. Um, there are numerous examples of people being socially canceled, if you, if you will, deplatformed off, off of various social media platforms and so on. And in some cases, for very little um, evidence or very little things to genuinely show for. So balancing safety with courage is really, really tough. Um, how must we cultivate courage and why? Well, if I'm not courageous enough to say certain things that I think matter for fear that I'm going to get harmed socially, if you will, then, yeah, it's not safe. So how do we get better safety, better courage in an organizational context? I need courage to speak up and say, hey, um, look, there's this thing happening in the river here. There's this um, plant is producing all of this toxic stuff that goes in the river. Uh, if it's unsafe, if I get summarily expelled from the organization, oh, that's not so good. So safety and courage has numerous um, implications for how do we get better? How do we actually be, become effective at oversight? If it's unsafe to speak up, what do we do? Well, we have to become more courageous. If we're too courageous, well, it means we haven't made it safe enough. So that's a really tricky balance to, to achieve this one because um, there are potentially significant um, adverse side effects to being too courageous or um, the organization being too unsafe. So um, what's ideal in this space? I don't know. We're going to have to discover what is possible. What we can say with a fair amount of certainty is what we have right now isn't working quite well enough. I think there's a lot of great opportunity to make things better. Because remember, we're not interested here in criticizing or disrespecting or demeaning any one constituency. We're interested in all humans having a voice, everybody being heard, but in an equitable fashion. Mm. So I think a way that it's depicted quite nicely is if you've ever seen the movie The Croods, the, the first movie of The Croods, it's a beautiful story that talks exactly about this metaphor of safety and courage. Especially in a world that keeps changing around you, you need courage, but you also need, need, need principles of safety that, that, uh, um, to actually uh, flourish. That's the word I was looking for. Mm. So the Cruz is a, for me, it's a beautiful metaphor as a movie depicting this tension between us two. Um, the next one is about optimizing utilization and optimizing flow. And this <laughs> is quite, I enjoyed uh, this exploring this tension as well uh, with some really knowledgeable people uh, in this space. Um, and we found some really fascinating things about what uh, uh, happens out there in the world when um, people focus on resource utilization and there are other people that say, no, we need to focus on optimizing the flow of what or value that we deliver. Now, Hori has already uh, alluded to the fact that value is in itself a big topic. Um, there's quite a lot of things that associates with value, but this is also, again, about two different perspectives about value. Um, one, of, one of the things that I noticed when I did my master's uh, degree research many years ago was that the worst possible way you can measure someone's productivity is by measuring the hours they spend behind their desk in the office. And 
I don't think my research needed to show that out. I can just, you can just ask anybody that sits in a job and if they measured by the hours, you get people that sit there from six till six every day and they're very productive, but nobody measures their outcomes. Nobody measures what they actually deliver and of what quality it is. So that was, a, a, for me, a big insight many years ago, starting off in, in, in my first job and then having to realize that I can sit for hours at my desk, look really productive, but not actually delivering anything. Uh, anyway, so this optimized utilization versus optimized flow is, again, the uh, conflict that we notice about how people try <clears throat> and sweat the assets versus how other people are trying to deliver value faster uh, and higher quality to, to customers. So, um, Horia, I, I, uh, I know I haven't given it justice because there's a lot of lean uh, principles and lean ideas that comes into this. Um, and uh, I know that uh, there are people like you and uh, other friends that we have that's actually yeah. uh, worked very deeply in this space. So uh, here is another way of, um, of looking at this. Optimizing utilization essentially says each individual must be fully utilized or as utilized as we can, right? This would be equivalent to on a highway, every inch of highway must have a car. Yeah, We have cars and cars and cars and cars. See, the highway is highly utilized. What happens if we have the highway so highly utilized? Well, we have a traffic jam. Because with so many cars, we're afraid of moving particularly fast. You never really see a very congested highway moving really fast. Yeah. So that has high utilization. The road is very utilized, but very little benefit because it takes ages for people to get to the destination. So the throughput of the highway is very, very low. Whereas if we say, let's figure out a way of optimizing flow, let's figure out a way of getting to the destination fairly fast. Let's make it so that the overall end-to-end, -end, A to B, time is as short as we can make it. We can't make it too short because then it means we go a bit too fast and that's illegal. That's not, not good. But within the bounds of the sort of maximum speed limit, what would be the best flow? Well, the best flow is if the highway is empty. I'm not having to wait for anybody else. I'm just going from one place to the other, maximum speed limit, I'm there. Yeah, but then the rest of the highway is empty. I'm the only one sort of getting from A to B. And therefore utilization is very, very low because there's only one car on the whole highway. That's no good. So the optimized utilization versus optimized flow is figuring out how much flow can I get for how much utilization? In other words, what's the least utilization to achieve maximum flow? As soon as I go beyond that limit of utilization, I'm starting to cost myself greater and greater um, impacts in terms of degraded or diminished flow. And unfortunately, the degradation isn't really linear. Usually it's, it's quite dramatic. All right, so there are branches of mathematic, mathematics called queuing theory uh, that show us in, in quite stark detail, as soon as your utilization kind of goes above 80%, you're, you're all, almost instantly slowing down to a crawl. Yeah? So what we want in terms of, remember our original intention, we want really enjoyable work that delivers uh, great services and um, great value to the people that we serve in a timely fashion. In other words, there has to be good flow of value. Therefore, we cannot afford to have kind of maximum utilization as well. And now that is also then in uh, conflict with the ion triangle, agile triangle uh, balance, because you want, I'm spending all this money. I don't want people twiddling thumbs. Well, there's twiddling some thumbs and twiddling thumbs. You have to understand why is it perfectly okay for people to have some slack capacity. If you insist on 
perfect utilization, you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot because you're going to get very poor throughput for people. So helping leaders and oversight communities and initiatives to become comfortable with some slack uh, in their timeframes, that is something really powerful in terms of achieving improved flow. And that requires, again, a lot of care and attention, a lot of appreciation from the leadership and oversight community. That's a great meta for the traffic. Thank you very much, Aurea. Um, so one of the things that we also noticed is that you can't just focus on one of, one of these balances. This is a constant orchestration to look at keeping balance across all of these balances. Um, and you can't just make a tweak in one place with, <laughs> or I just showed about the optimized flow and utilization and how it affects the iron and uh, agile triangle. So you can't just make a tweak or bring um, balance in one aspect. So this is a really interesting puzzle to solve because you're gonna be constantly doing a rebalancing across all of these six dimensions on a regular basis and in some organizations we may never achieve balance and in some we may have achieved balance perfectly for one day and then it's all out of balance again the next day so um this is uh, uh this is the approach now the we gave you some reasons why we came up with the the, the thinking behind balances and it's the and thinking and so on and we were uh, using today as well, uh, we wanted to use today to explain how we came to understanding this. So we'll talk a little bit about our research approach uh, to this. And um, before you show the next picture, Horia, just hold on. Um, Horia um, and I have a business partner called Gareth Holbrook. And Gareth and I uh, attended a training course that was run by Pat Reed about two and a half or three years ago. Um, and this was at the same time that we were scratching our heads about, we saw the phenomenon that we, uh, of this friction between the, the oversight capability and the, these agile people, um, <laughs> we were called at that at one stage. Um, and, uh, we, we saw this tension, but we, we didn't really understand or know how to approach the research uh, about it. And in the training course that uh, Pat Reed provided, she introduced us to a model. And that model was the breakthrough for us to actually move into uh, getting this understanding that it's an and thinking. And the model that we use, and I'm not going to go into much detail around this, there's quite a lot to be read about it, but we've adapted the polarity mo model and the thinking that goes with that and the approach um, to come up with these balances that, or, or these polarity pairs that we, that we found. Now, one of the most difficult things to actually get right when you work with polarity mapping is what are the actual polarities? It's not always apparent what are the two opposing forces at play here. And it took us quite a while to actually figure out these six polarity pairs or the, these six balances that we, that we talk about as part of the AO uh, research that we've done. But it's usually not the first thing that you think it is the, uh, the, 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 the tension causing uh, opposing forces and the process that polarity mapping um, takes you through was a really really useful for us to think through and figure out what are the actual things that we need to balance now if we have missed anything we'll ask you at the uh, end of this episode as well there's ways to con that you can contribute to tell us what we have missed when it comes to adaptive oversight but this is a key cornerstone of how we actually conducted our research. Polarity pairs, if you can zoom in a little bit on, uh, on uh, in it, um, it actually starts with once you've identified the actual tension pairs or the, the, the polarities, or yeah, now just uh, uh, zoom in slightly more, thank you. Um, 
we found that there's a specific pattern or way in which you would start conducting it. And there's other views about how you would go about using this polarity pair. But we found the easiest way that we found is, is that we put the two tensions uh, in there. And then we asked, we started off with on the left hand side of the polarity pair, what was the positive results for having that? Okay, so for instance, in the case of control and trust, what are the positive aspects when we talk about oversight? What positive aspects of control do we have? Then what we did is we jumped straight to the to the uh, to the to that block there, where we asked, what is it that you fear? What are the downsides of having too much focus on the trust aspect of it or on the opposing force? And then we moved up to asking, what are the positive results from having that opposing things? And then lastly, we move to what are the fears? What are the negative aspects of having too much control, for instance, of the, of the, uh, the, the opposing force? And what these arrows indicate here, it's not just a once-off uh, conversation. It means that you continuously talk around this and you build this out. So it's not a single conversation. It is actually a series of conversations that you have until you've built up enough data in order to make an inf uh, to, in order to move this ahead. This little word and is really the key of the polarity map for myself, because it tells me that there is a way. We just have to agree that we can find it together, and the way that we do that is through dialogue. So these arrows is about the flow of the conversation. Once you've done the and, you look at the two negative sides of both sides, and then you ask, what are the deeper fear from not having balance between those two? And then when you agree what that thing is that you are both trying to prevent to happen, then you ask, what is the greater purpose statement? What is it that we achieve together? And that's where the and is the key. Why balance this polarity? Why do you want to have balance between those two? And that's the breakthrough moment. Once you've achieved that, then you can ask, right, what are the action steps we need to do on both sides, on this side and on that side, in order to maintain a positive, the positive results from focusing on these sides. And then you got to ask what are the indicators or the measurable indicators that will let you know that you're falling back into this old tension. And this is a beautiful model that helped us through actually understanding that governance, that was a key insight for us that this, uh, that, Adaptive oversight is not about creating further division. It's about actually bringing people together and coming up with a, a greater purpose statement and balancing both perspectives. We interviewed this. We set a, a bunch of interviews up. We interviewed people from across the world, prominent people in the uh, agile space, in the governance space. Uh, people that's worked in projects, programs, and portfolios. And we actually uh, managed to interview them and take them through a series uh, of these balances. We had, <laughs> we each person that participated had eight sessions with us that we actually unpicked what it means to balance these initial eight balances that we've had. And we systematically stepped through each one of these eight things, uh, eight elements of the polarity map um, in order to come up. And that's the raw research. Now, Horia, I don't know if you can pan and scroll out and show the scope of the research uh, that we have actually concluded. That would be 
something like this a few thousand data points okay there we go <laughs> and this is this is quite a lot so the podcast series is about that data that you're seeing there and i'm pretty sure that with everybody else contributing uh, as part of the podcast this is just going to continue the thinking and the research uh, into this area and that is why again it's an invitation uh, for your participation and come tell us what what we what we may have missed as well as um, uh, what else uh, may may be suitable in this context remember we're talking about adaptive oversight and we want to build bridges between uh, in organizations between mm. these opposing forces that that exists we also invite you to come along and notice uh, what we've paid attention to and see how well does that speak for you as well. Now, uh, for those of you uh, paying close attention to the video, uh, you may have noticed that Aldo, uh, when he was moving the, the sticky around, uh, he jumped a little bit uh, from uh, this top left corner to the bottom right, but he was describing essentially actually following the arrows. So it's the values of the left versus the fears uh, from over-focusing on the left to the neglect of the right, and then uh, top right, bottom left. So he described it correctly, but moved the sticky <laughs> a little bit, um, sort of counter uh, indicative. So it's just as the graphic shows, that's the general flow of left pole values versus left pole fears, then right port, uh, pole values versus right pole fears, and then the combination of what, uh, uh, what uh, overall fears and what overall benefits, and then what warning signs and action steps uh, to take to exercise balance. But this taught me quite a lot about creating a win-win situation. This is a beautiful model um, mm. for conflict resolution, where you sense high, high degrees of polarization in your organization, in your team, nationally, internationally. Um, this is a great tool. Um, that helped us through our thinking when it comes to adaptive oversight. Now, we're getting towards the end of today's episode. Um, we um, uh, have shared uh, that mile-wide, inch-deep perspective of our adaptive oversight model. Uh, we've shown you a little bit about the research that we've done, and we've invited you twice now on to coming and joining the journey. Come in, actually... Uh, come and discuss. We, we'd be happy to uh, receive comments. If you want to come and discuss any of these things uh, with us on, a live, on an episode as well, we're happy to get you on as a guest. If you've got something to contribute, please come and make this better. It is for everybody's benefit um, that, that, that we hope that this will make achieve our vision of having happy workplaces and making work joyful um, and if you've got contributions and comments please come tell us what we've missed and tell us what we've got wrong um, we're really happy and open for you to come and do that and ways um, of contributing will be available in the comments associated with um, the either video or podcast in whichever platform you find uh, you will find the appropriate details in each platform's description. Thank you. Thank you, Aurea. Okay, well, that's the end of uh, uh, episode two today. Um, in the next episode, we will, in the next number of episodes, let me rephrase that, we are going to be uh, doing a, a deeper dive on each of these six uh, balances to actually start making our research open and available uh, for discussion and actually making it better, making it shine, making it useful for people out there. Now, remember, we're also going to invite um, other contributors to come along and be interviewed um, in our exploration. The general idea is one of taking a walk together and looking at things from multiple perspectives. Some people use the fancy word perambulation. 
um, the basic notion is I look at something from one perspective, then I walk a few more steps, I look at it again from a different perspective. And when I integrate the various uh, views from the various locations, I end up with a much richer understanding of what it is that we've covered. And we're going to do this at different levels, both at the level of each individual balance and then at the level of the integrated overview. And while this may look like a model in the form that is reflected here, it describes a structure of balances, there is also a process, there is also a dynamic of the dialogue. So it's a bit more than just a model. Um, I wouldn't call it a methodology or method as such. It's more a way of exploring, a way of discovering, a way of thinking about how to go about creating more impactful, more effective balance of oversight for organizations. Perfect. This is The Focus, episode two. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. See you next time.